can be said to be objective truth is that there is no objective truth. Like you kill a baby feet, it's the same thing as killing any old inanimate object. I would argue that we certainly are not all created equal. Mark is training a new generation of leaders. To take on the culture of death and win. You, 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 you young people, it's your movement now. It's not your parents anymore. The blood that is shed cries out to God from the ground for justice. And now, here's Mark. Well, folks, it's been a crazy week in America, hasn't it? Uh, on Monday, we had the U.S. Supreme Court hand down the decision of June Medical versus Rousseau. We had statues around the country being toppled by Black Lives Matter activists, including in our own hometown here in Columbus, Ohio, they removed the Christopher Columbus statue from the front of city council, believe it or not. So you gotta wonder if we're gonna have to rename uh, Columbus to something else. I don't know, maybe Karl Marx city, I, I'm not sure. But it's been a crazy week, and we're going to be talking about all these things today on the Mark Harrington Show with your radio activist, Mark Harrington. And you can find out more by going to our website at markharrington.org. That's markharrington.org. So what I want to do is try to bring all these things together and talk about how we should be shaping culture in a postmodern world, the postmodern world. Because, and I've said this before, we are experiencing nothing short than a moral and cultural revolution right before our eyes. Now, I've been around a long time. And, uh, you know, for those young people out there, this may not seem like a big deal, but we are seeing a paradigm shift in culture and morality right before our eyes here in America. And it's in due in large part to the rejection of truth and the adoption of what we call postmodern uh, philosophy or postmodern view. And to get the show started, I just want to give you a working definition of postmodernism because a lot of people, you know, it gets thrown about, the word gets used, the phrase gets used here and there. But it's basically this, a Western philosophy of the late 20th and 21st century, uh, which is characterized by broad skepticism. We see that right now. Subjectivist, uh, subjectivism, we see that right now, relativism, and a general suspicion of reason. Uh, this is what we're seeing in the streets right now, folks. Uh, skepticism, relativism, and just a suspicion of reason. That is the rejection of truth. And at the heart of that, when it comes to uh, abortion is the rejection of what we call Imago Dei, the image of God, which is a central tenet of Christianity. It's found in the book of Genesis. Uh, that, re that, that idea that we were rejecting the image of God is prevalent within postmodernism. Now, you might want to say, well, listen, but we're, we're moving heaven and earth to try to save people from coronavirus. Obviously, we care about the image of God. We care about image bearers, you and I, human beings. And and then you see what happened with George Floyd and, you know, the world went on fire because everyone was upset that George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis by a police officer. And you got to wonder, well, are we really rejecting the image of God? Well, we are when it comes to the pre-born. And uh, you know, I've been having lots of discussions about this movement or this organization called Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. And I don't want to spend the entire program on that. We've spent a lot of time in past programs on it. But I was taking a walk the other day, Mr. Producer, you can pop up that sign. This is a uh, yard sign that's really prevalent now in communities across America. And I'm taking my walk, my daily walk uh, in, the, in my own neighborhood. And this is the sign that uh, that, you know, I came across and it's everywhere right now. And it says basically this. If you if you want to understand postmodernism, folks, you want to understand the rejection of truth. This this sign uh, is a good summary of that. It says at the top, we believe that black lives matter. Well, I, I do, too, by the way, I think everyone does. No human is illegal. I guess that's uh, basically saying that uh, if you're an illegal immigrant, 
that you're, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Love is love. Of course, that's a, that has to do with homosexuality, apparently. Women's rights or human's right? human rights? Well, that's about abortion. What about unborn rights? I wonder if they believe that. Science is real. I, you know, hello? I mean, yeah, okay, sure. So they're basically saying people like myself don't believe in science, right? Because we're not climate change activists. Uh, it's funny, these folks will reject that the life begins at conception, but they think science is real. Water is life. I guess that's a, a dig at, the, uh, at uh, creationism. You know, if you have water and you have rock, put those together, you have life. I guess that's what they're saying. But this is just what we're seeing across America. Postmodernism. We've been, uh, you know, now decades uh, uh, believing this stuff. And we have to be able to understand how we can shape culture in the midst of a postmodern America, uh, because we are moving at light speed towards the rejection of truth and this cultural revolution that we're seeing, the tearing down of statues is just the beginning. This is aimed at the heart of who we are as a uh, Christian civilization in America. So. When we look just generally, let's just look at the abortion issue for an example. Uh, we're winning and we're losing. If you look, abortions are down, but pill abortions are up. Abortion mills are closing, but telemedicine is taking off. Legislatively, we're making progress around the edges, but we just had a gigantic defeat in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Some people are downplaying this. I think it's a big deal. When you have Justice Roberts, who's the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, voting with the liberals on the court uh, on a very narrow restriction to abortion regarding abortionists uh, admitting privileges to hospitals. I mean, we can't even get that done at the U.S. Supreme Court right now. And um, in culture generally, uh, we are slowly changing public opinion, but nothing at the rate that we should be on abortion. And, you know, I've been at this for a while and I look at it uh, uh, two ways. Basically, on the one hand, we're losing. There's no doubt that uh, the pro-life movement is not su being successful in outlawing abortion, which is the goal eventually. Right. Uh, we need to do that by first making it unthinkable in order to make it unlawful. We're certainly not getting that done. But on the other side of the coin, uh, the fact that we're even in the fight uh, <laughs> Is, is something to be encouraged about because of most countries around the world and most mes Western nations for that matter, abortion's not even a thing. I mean, it's not even a debate. It's not even a political issue. At least in the United States, we're still having a debate about it. Uh, it's still up for grabs, I guess. And that's a good thing. So when it comes to the reality of the moral and cultural revolution, abortion itself, the killing of the unborn, cannot exist in a vacuum. In other words, it doesn't exist by itself as a separate social issue. It's part of this entire fabric of what's going on in America. We have the rejection of truth, the rejection of all our sexual mores, you know, homosexuality, LGBTQ, uh, marijuana use, all of these social indicators are all going in one direction. We can't expect abortion to go in a totally different direction. It's just a it's just not going to happen. It's just not. Uh, and we need to get past this idea that we have a cheap political, or that we have a solution politically. Uh, there are no cheap solutions to end abortion. Uh, we can't just, at the uh, waving of a wand, uh, end this. It's not going to happen that way. And that's because politics is downstream from culture. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be working for a political solution. Obviously, we need to be firing on all political cylinders we can on public policy, whether it be at the presidential level, getting a president who could nominate justices to the U.S. Supreme Court to, to change the court to be anti-Roe, or we work at the state level, at the state legislatures, to try to institute bans on abortion, outright, um, outright bans on abortion, and try to challenge those uh, legislators and the governor and the attorney general to not recognize Roe v. Wade, we need to keep going at it on both of those um, tracks. But let me just speak about the U.S. Supreme Court real quick, and then I want to get into what our responses should be to the moral and cultural revolution that we're seeing. Uh, it's 
it's obvious to anybody, I would hope, that the the strategy of changing the U.S. Supreme Court has failed, and we haven't been successful. Clearly, I mean, what they argued in the court uh, this session wasn't about the legality of abortion, wasn't about the constitutionality of abortion. It wasn't even about Roe versus Wade. It was about a very narrow restriction that was instituted in Louisiana to try to restrict abortionists uh, by giving, you know, requiring that they have admitting privileges. I mean, that's what we're debating. Uh, I didn't sign up for the let's regulate abortion uh, movement. I signed up for Let's Abolish Abortion Movement. I've been calling for it ever since I started doing this decades ago. But we've had five pro-life presidents since 1973 when they handed down, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down Roe versus Wade. And in those five uh, presidential terms, and some of them were more than one term, We've had eight nominees. Four of those have turned out to be liberals that have voted with the pro-abortion table or block of the U.S. Supreme Court, and four have voted pro-life. Right now in the U.S. Supreme Court, from what I can tell, there's only two anti-row votes. We don't know about Gorsuch. We don't know about Kavanaugh. And I think for now, we know about Justice Roberts. So the idea that we're going to ro uh, reverse Roe v. Wade in the short term is wishful thinking uh, at best and maybe just naivete at the worst. So here's the thing. What are the response? What are we going to do? You know, what, what, how do we respond to this moral and cultural revolution? How do we shape culture in a postmodern world? But basically, I, I boil it down to three possibilities, three responses to this cultural and moral revolution. Number one, we can be idealistic. Uh, you know, the rose-colored glasses, we can be naive about it, kind of live in denial about what's happening, keep doing what we've been doing for the last several decades, only offering platitudes and uh, symbolism over substance. In other words, we don't really get to the heart of the problem and go after it. Uh, we could do that, and we can be continuing to talk about the imminent overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, but obviously there's problems with that. I mean, anybody with any kind of sense is going to look at things and say, that's not very likely. Number two, we could just be pessimistic and cynical, basically drop it out, you know, and go hunker down in our basements or somewhere, you know, out in the country somewhere and stockpile weapons and wait for Armageddon to happen, you know, and then pick up after it's all over and rebuild. I, I guess I guess that's an option, but it's not one that's viable, especially for Christians who are called to make disciples of the nations. I think the third option is the one we got to stick with. And this is what we believe here at Created Equal. And that is we take the long view, uh, that we take a sober assessment of the reality, and then we plan accordingly. And that's what we've been doing here at Created Equal. So what do we do to shape culture in a postmodern world? Well, we continue to do what we have been doing, and that is to try to change individual hearts and minds. If we never overturn Roe, we can at least hopefully persuade enough people not to kill their babies that it becomes unthinkable. And then, you know, you know eventually the law would change, I guess. But if the law doesn't, it's kind of like cigarette smoking. You know, two dec decades ago, I don't know how many people smoked, probably half, maybe three decades ago. Half the American people probably smoked, maybe a third, I don't know. But today, it's hard to find somebody that does. Why? Because of the educational campaigns against smoking. People have come to the conclusion it's bad for them, right? And I think we could do the same on abortion, proving that it's bad, A, for the baby who is killed by abortion, also not good for the woman, for the parent. So whether we outlaw abortion or not, our, our, our mission remains the same. But we do need people with vision, like the men of Issachar, which it says in the Old Testament, understood the times, understood the times and knew what Israel should do. There has to be a few of us, not everybody, but there has to be a few of us that are constantly evaluating culture, that are coming up with ideas, not not 
you know, fly and not not uh, shirt tail on file, uh, reactionary type uh, events or projects, but more long term strategies and tactics that we pursue in and out of season, whether we're the political winds are at our back or they're at our face, we continue on and we march forward. Uh, and and that's you know what we're trying to do here at Created Equal. So one of the tactics, well, look, first of all, let me back up. You've got strategy and tactics are two separate things. Strategy is the overarching, um, the overarching vision and goal. So the overarching vision is a abortion-free America. The goal is to outlaw abortion. That's always been the the, the uh, the, the case for the pro-life movement. But underneath that, you have tactics, and those are specific actions or steps that we use to achieve that end, that specific end of ending abortion. And so for us, there's there's two tactics, basically, and they're, they're both truth-telling tactics. I mean, that's, a, that's what we're about. We're about telling the truth. We're about uh, sharing the truth about abortion, what it does to women, what it does to the babies. And we go to where we have receptive fields. That is the harvest is uh, where people are open-minded, where they actually want to listen. That's why we go to college campuses. Um, because we're in the business of changing hearts and minds. And we're not going to go to the hardcore pro-abortion activists and try to uh, convince them. That, that's a waste of time. And what we want to do is find people who are in the middle ground, and that's where most Americans are. And we want to go where we can have the biggest impact, and that's on a college and high school campus. And that's what we do primarily. We don't want to go where we're, our message isn't going to be received. Why? Because the Bible tells us uh, not to do that. Jesus talked about it when he sent the disciples out in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he said, quote, do not give what is holy to the dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, he said, or they will trample them under their feet and turn them uh, and turn and tear you to pieces. Now think about that. I mean, if that doesn't fit today, if that isn't relevant for today, I don't know what is. Don't give what's holy to the dogs. Honestly, we're not going to convince Antifa to be pro-life. We're not going to convince Antifa to be reasonable. We're not going to convince Black Lives Matter activists, hardcore. Now, I'm not just saying people that care about Black Lives. Don't get me wrong. They're obviously there's that's a worthy goal, and we're all for it. But the activists, the organization, the neo-Marxists—that's who they are. Uh, the leadership, anyway. We're not going to waste our time throwing what's holy, that is God's truth to the dogs, uh, because we'll be trampled under their feet and they'll tear you to pieces. That's what will happen. Um, so we go where we have a receptive field and we do two things. There's basically two tactics. One is to, to truth telling on abortion, using abortion victim photography. And the second is the gospel of Jesus Christ, combining those two things. Now, all truth is God's truth, right? We understand that. It's not, we don't have a spiritual compartment and a secular compartment. They're all together. All truth is God's truth, but the gospel specifically, that is the forgiveness of sin that comes through Jesus Christ, is something that we need to be preaching. But we also need to be preaching the truth about abortion when it comes to logic, philosophy, legal, you know, legal issues, constitutionality, science, biology, all of it, philosophy, that kind of thing has to be taught. And we do that primarily, the, that truth telling on abortion by using abortion victim photography and video. Why is that? Why is that? Because it works. It's effective. We know it's effective. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of studies, but there's been some, some things here and there that prove that. But anecdotally, we know it works. We have people that change their minds simply because they saw the photos. Historically, we know it works because of social reform movements successfully have uh, made a difference in the in the years past when it comes to civil rights or anti-child labor or anti-war, uh, other movements like that. We know they work. And we know that we should do it because we love our neighbor. And the best way to love our neighbor is to represent them. And we can't represent them directly, but they can represent themselves with the images. 
If you don't believe me, I mean, we just have to look at the last couple of weeks. The image, the video of George Floyd, that image, that video went viral. The moment it did, it changed everything uh, when it came to the issue of racism. Whether this police officer is going to be proven in a court of law to have racist motives or not, it didn't matter because the activists on the other side of this issue, on the issue of uh, racism, uh, of uh, you know this whole question, uh, this video was used to advance uh, racial equality across America. Now, of course, it led to violence and looting and arson and all that other stuff. But you cannot deny the use of the, the these images, these powerful images. Uh, I could go, and I have an entire talk about this: how uh, victim photography uh, changes culture. But I mean, overnight, the issue of police brutality against African Americans was, you know, the only thing, and it's really what we've been talking about for weeks now. Uh, the other thing is, uh, when you look at civil rights, you look at the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a young boy. He was 1955. His 15-year-old boy lived in Chicago with his mother and went to his uncles, great uncles, in Money, Mississippi. Uh, to visit for the summer. And when he went down there, his mother, Amy Till, I'm sorry, Mamie Till, basically warned him and said, listen, don't, gave, her, gave him a couple warnings. I won't go into detail with those, but he violated one of those when he went to the local grocery store and he whistled at a white clerk. And unfortunately, Emmett Till was brutally murdered. Uh, a gin fan, which you can see if you're watching online, was tied around his neck and he was thrown into the Tallahatchie River uh, and he was retrieved. And then the coroner attempted to seal his casket, nail it shut. And the reason for that is he didn't want anyone to know how they treated African-American young men in the South in the 1950s. And so in order to cover it up, to censor it, he tried to nail it shut. Well, his mother, Mamie Till, would have nothing of that. And they shipped the casket and the body up to Chicago for a burial, for a funeral. And she opened the casket on racial injustice by showing the, the brutalized body of Emmett Till before thousands, 50,000 people came by the, uh, the casket of Emmett Till that weekend. And that changed America. Uh, that, that one event changed America for good and the civil rights movement. It was, a, it was a consensus. It was a big change. And so we use victim photography and we should continue to because it tells the truth about abortion. And then finally, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can, we can change someone's mind on abortion, but if we don't get them the full way. We don't get them to the, the final destination if we don't deal with the issue of sin, personal sin. And that's where the gospel comes in. And that's what Created Equal does. Uh, we share the gospel with those who are out on the streets with us commonly because we understand that uh, uh, the important thing is the salvation of souls. And if we're going to see a cultural revolution in the other direction, we have to see the discipleship of the nations, which has to come from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we do here at Created Equal. And we will continue to use these tactics using victim photography, truth telling, and the gospel of Jesus Christ in season or out in a postmodern world where the rejection of truth, unfortunately, is really the common uh, position of most Americans today as we're seeing the, the nation uh, basically repudiate truth and our history right before our eyes. Finally, folks, we're going to be going to the Democrat National Convention. And I want you to quickly uh, consider coming with us. That'll be on August 13 through 19. We've got about a month and a half, assuming they're going to have one up there. Again, sharing the truth about abortion and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to be part of that, just let us know. Go to uh, createdequal.org and uh, just shoot us an email. Say, hey, I'd like to join you in, the, uh, in Milwaukee at the Democrat National Convention. So in summary, keep shaping truth, shaping culture by using the truth of abortion 
and the gospel of Jesus Christ in season or out, political winds with us or against us. That's how we do it in a postmodern world. We'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless America. And remember America to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to become a witness against the evil Evil. plague in America, call Created Equal at 614-269-7808. That's 614-269-7808. Or go online to createdequal.net. Createdequal.net. Be sure to tune to The Mark Harrington Show next time for your marching orders in the culture war.